And uh, we actually met as fledgling developers when we were presenting our, at least our first game and your second game up at Universal Interactive Studios in LA. That's right. And what, what strikes me most is that when we were doing that, people were saying, no one's going to buy CD-ROM based cartridge, you know, based systems. Cartridge is instant boot. I don't want to deal with scratching. I have cabinets that'll handle my cartridges. I don't have cabinets for my CDs. That's for music. And the first system, 3DO, sold quite slowly. Uh, I was, was working on it, and people were saying, ooh, this 3D, you know, you can't judge distance in a character action game. It may not work as well. And then we went on to create Crash and Spyro, and the rest is history. And, and, and it really was. I mean, it's, it's actually very similar to what we're experiencing today in VR, in that we were, uh, there weren't that many independent developers out there, because most had been scared away by the cost of cartridge-based systems. And all of a sudden, there was this blossoming of uh, sort of independent spirit within the industry because you could be a garage developer and jump into consoles and make some pretty cool stuff. The, in, the industry had kind of calcified because you needed the money from a large publisher to get a game printed on cartridge. And Andy and I, my partner at Naughty Dog, we left the industry because we didn't think that there was a window for us. And then Trip Hawkins called up and said, we're going to put it on CD-ROM. Price is going to go from 18 bucks to a buck. We were back in and you know, the, the rest is history. And I think the same thing happened in the mobile phone business when the big players, well, it doesn't have a, 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 a good input uh, system, uh, the games won't work on it, it's too short use case. And it took a little while, but the, the companies that stuck with it uh, and got in there early, some of them became billion dollar companies. Yeah. So we're hoping the same thing happens in VR. And, uh, and it was 21 years after we met that you joined Oculus, and when I heard that, I, just, I gave Jason a call and said, hey, you know what, we should, let's, let's do something together. I'm not sure if I called you or you called me. I can't remember. I think I called you. I, I don't remember. Yeah. It was a whirlwind right then. I, you have 12 months to get games out on Rift, get started. So call everybody you know was the way I remember. Yeah. So we started, and uh, yesterday, we released our third collaboration together. This is, uh, and we're going to show you a quick bit of a game called The Unspoken, which just came out yesterday. It is one of the first games to use the touch controller for the Oculus Rift. So let's check it out. So what's been really fun for us as a more traditional developer is to take advantage of pretty amazing hardware. I mean, you guys have been listening, uh, hearing about it all day, experiencing it yourselves, and having a touch controller where you can see and, and feel your hands in, in real time in a VR space opens up a lot of gameplay possibilities that we hadn't uh, ever considered. And, I, I don't, and we didn't really introduce ourselves in terms of what we've done in the past. If, if you guys know console games, we've made a bunch of more traditional games like Ratchet and Clank, Sunset Overdrive, Spyro the Dragon, uh, Resistance, and diving into VR for us, as we'll discuss in a moment, was uh, like starting over again in some ways. So what Jason and I are going to do is ask each other 
a bunch of questions, and hopefully the answers will be useful for everybody here. But then we're going to open it up at some point and get some questions from the audience. Yeah. So Jason, for you, uh, VR is arguably new. And now that we're eight months in, at least to the sort of the Oculus high, uh, high def headsets and the like, uh, you know, what is the state of VR in yeah. your opinion? That's a really good question. So uh, Oculus launched its first consumer device a year and a couple of days ago when we launched Gear VR. Um, and then we have two launches, one of them yesterday and the original Rift launch uh, March 28th. And I would say 2016 was the year of hardware showing up and hardware being real. Uh, VR is real. Um, two, two and a half years ago when I joined Oculus, we thought it was going to basically be us and, and maybe Valve. Uh, and at this point, you have Google on the match, Microsoft's announcements, Sony clearly. Um, everybody is in. And I think with Microsoft next year, you'll see the hardware. And so VR has become real. If you look at Oculus's statements over the years, we've been very consistent that we believe that VR was going to take some time to reach mass market. We believe in the hockey stick. We think it's coming. Uh, we don't believe it's this year. We don't believe it's next year. Uh, but we do believe it's coming. And our goal at this point, now that we've put out our complete hardware on both mobile and PC, is to allow the development community to take that hardware and really iterate. Because uh, there is a strong base. When we put it on people's heads in Best Buy, when we put it on people's heads wherever we go, there's a strong inclination to buy. But I don't think we've yet uh, struck gold with what the content uh, that they want to buy is, what the content that they want is. And by the way, we're going to focus a little more on consumer here and not on B2B. B2B uh, is a different business. But I think uh, there are a lot of things that we've put out that could have been done in 2D uh, to the point of the panel, panel earlier. And that is because when you're told, go, you have 12 months to put something on the shelf, a developer tends to go back to what they know. Now that the hardware is out there, uh, the SDK can be downloaded free and anyone can develop. I think the next 12 months, 24 months, are where the real creativity is going to happen. And you're going to see things, genres you've never seen before, ideas you've never seen before. And one of those, or more than one of those things, will strike the consumer. And that's when you start to see adoption happen. Uh, so I think VR is in a great place right now because it exists, it's real, and it's available in your local store. But I don't think we've yet reached the point at which we have the perfect mix of content uh, available on it to drive the consumers in mass into stores to buy it. Um, so that's where I think it is. And uh, where are we for developers? Like, so how, how does the developer look at that? Uh, it's, well, first of all, I, I want to know, how many people here are actually actively developing VR games? All right, a pretty good number. That's good. So a lot of what I'm going to say I hope is relevant to you. Uh, as if you got into VR any time in the last year, uh, f from my perspective, it, it's leveled the playing field. It means that anybody, whether you're a small company or who's... Uh, maybe been around for a while, a giant company who just started up, which just seems like opposites, you have the same opportunity to succeed versus the more traditional game space where if you're in the console world, it's become an arms race, which is really hard to break into just because the games cost so much and the expectations are so high. With VR, anything's, anything's possible, and it's a really cool place to be. And I, I don't know how long that window is going to be open, but... As a developer, I would, if I was starting out, I would jump right into this one because you can stand out just as readily as somebody who has 20 years of experience in making traditional games. And, and part of the reason for that is it's, it's forced all of us to think differently about how we design games. In particular for Insomniac, it's really forced us to think, go outside of our comfort zone. We're very used to making s traditional games with traditional control schemes, traditional cameras, and we had to throw all of that out the window when we started developing for VR. And in some ways, that was cathartic for us. And it was, it was fun to have those challenges and to sort of force ourselves to think, say, how, could, how, how can we do this differently? Uh, and then finally, I think for developers, it forces all of us to pick our heads up and, and ask, where is this industry? Where is the gaming industry going in general? Now that VR has come in as an arguably disruptive force, uh, we can't necessarily pin all of our hopes and dreams on a, an industry that's going to stay wedded to mobile or maybe console or PC. Now we've got this other, other angle uh, and that, it, as Jason said, looks like it could have a hockey stick. Should we be there? Uh, should we be learning right now to, 
under, to, to build those sort of tools so that we can you know, go where the industry could go in the next several years. So uh, I'm talking about us as developers, and I know there are a lot of new and sort of veteran developers who are starting, but a question for you, Jason, when it comes to sort of your overview of the VR development field, who really is in and who's out? Because there's some big names that are conspicuously absent right now. Yeah, well, and, and that's the opportunity. Uh, if you remember when mobile launched, there were some big names that were out. Uh, they are all now in, many of them through acquisitions in the billion plus range. And it was small independents that created new ideas and figured the medium out uh, that then had such a lead on their knowledge of what worked and what didn't work that when the large companies came in and tried to chase, they couldn't catch up. And the only logical thing for them to do was to acquire that talent, uh, and in some cases, the IP and other things like that. So from my perspective, I think more are in than we see, because there's a lead time before you make an announcement that you're working on things. Certainly Ubisoft, for example, on the, big, the, 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 you know, the high end game side has been developing games. They have multiple games out. Uh, there are games out from Take Two. EA has put titles on the shelf with other platforms, Sony, uh, and I think Google Daydream. Um, they're dabbing their toes in, but these are battleships. And for these battleships to steer these massive teams that are sitting on billion dollar franchises is difficult. And although I speak to the developers and internally they're itching to kind of get, get to what they see as the future, there's a business reality that that big a team can't immediately pivot onto something smaller, especially when last year it had a zero installed base. So there's going to be this opportunity for smaller devs to get in there and make a difference. And that is what our two teams did, in effect, in this, at the same time in the cartridge yeah. CD transition. And both of us, I ended up transitioning and selling the company. You're still here today as one of the largest independent developers because of the fact that we took advantage of that window. And that isn't to say that it was easy. It was, it was brutally hard. You and I remember there were many times where we both of us thought we were on the edge of going under. Um, but we, we stuck with it, and we managed to create something that was unique. And both of our companies, uh, mine with Sony and I'm not there anymore, yours uh, with you, are still there to kind of lead forward. So who's in and who's out? I think more are in than, we, than we, we've seen, but there is still this opportunity. I think it's probably a window that closes in a, a year or two where smaller independents and mid-sized companies can come out and make a name for themselves and become the large next generation companies. So you were alluding to that time when we were, we were growing, right? And we were facing a lot of risk. And I remember in particular, you were making Jack and Daxter, we were making Ratchet and Clank. And those were, uh, in, in, at least by today's standards, medium-sized games in terms of the budget. So after that, it seemed as, as if in the console business in particular, and maybe the PC business, the market for medium-sized games just died. There was no opportunity for developers to go out and find funding for something that was in the sort of the 10 million-ish range. We either made giant games or you made tiny games. Is, is, is it back? Is, the, is this now the era of medium-sized games because of VR? At least for the meanwhile, I think it is. There, I remember when uh, Vita came out, and I was talking to someone from Sony who doesn't need to be named. He said, what's beautiful about this is the budgets are smaller than they are on our console. And I said, for now. And he said, no, 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 we think they're going to, they never stay small. And a year later, his budgets have doubled, and they continue to double on mobile. So budgets will continue to increase. But again, now is not the time for the big publisher to come in. And they don't operate very well on small titles in general. So there's an opportunity right now for what, what you're calling a mid-sized title to be the big title. Yeah. And the big titles tend to attract word of mouth, they, the network effect, they tend to be successful. And right now, what we're seeing on PC at least, is that there's a lot of things that are in the demo to short, small, sub-million dollar budget that are, some of them are profitable because at that rate you can sell a decent number of copies. But that's not where most of the excitement is. When the bigger titles come out, that's what the consumer's noticing. And although right now the sustainability of, say, an 8 or $10 million title is not there, in a few years I think that's going to be the sweet spot. And then slowly over time, look, it, there will be a title that's $100 million in a few years. There will be a title that's a quarter billion like there has been in the console and PC business, inevitably, uh, and perhaps more effectively in VR than, is, than on the console. So yes, right now I think that there is a mid-sized market that doesn't really exist in a lot of other places. 
So let me ask you one more uh, related to that. So as we see games growing in terms of their budgets on VR, and hopefully the VR audience uh, expanding as a corollary or, or at the same time, do you think that's where VR is going to have its biggest impact? Or do you think there's another place where VR is going to be just take off that we haven't really, as game developers, been thinking about? Yeah. Facebook and Oculus are convinced that games and entertainment more broadly is not the end state for VR. Uh, we, uh, we believe that social, uh, large-scale consumer applications um, are going to be massive. I, I think, you know, again, going back to mobile, because there are a lot, things do repeat themselves. Games launched the mobile stores. They're still a very large part of the ecosystem. But the Ubers of the world and the Airbnbs that nobody could have predicted when the iPhone came out are also a massive part of that business, as is the Facebooks and everything else in the world. So the question is, what do you do right now? And uh, it seems that the things that are monetizing best right now are entertainment. Yeah. Uh, it's been hard for those that are creating non-interactive entertainment to charge that much for them. Uh, but over time, I believe, the market gets bigger, the opportunities for IAP and DLC and uh, you know, whatever other monetization method gets in there that the market will become a lot larger. The other ad advantage to starting now, even if your long-term goal is not to be in games, is that real-time engines are fundamentally driving this. There are you know, film, light field technologies that are being discussed. The cost of that, the timing of that, it'll be a while until that has any kind of impact. So if you happen to be making small games and the market gets to the point where it does branch out behind, beyond entertainment, if FTD needs a florist app, it's gotta be built by a game developer you know, basically someone on a game engine, right? The Unreals, uh, 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 the Unities of the world, this is going to drive VR. So that what you're learning about VR and what you're learning making games has applications outside of games in the long run as everything kind of is driven by 3D graphics and, and, and kind of the underpinnings of that game world as opposed to the web 2D based background that mobile still mainly relies on. Uh, so I, I believe that even if in the long term you're Dream is not games. Dream is not entertainment. Entertainment's a good stepping stone to get there. Cool. Do you want? Yeah. Okay. Let me let me ask you a couple. Yeah. So, you know, Insomniac is twenty some odd years old, and you've been developing for the most part what we call two D games in Oculus. That it, they're three D now, but they're on a two D <laughs> screen, right? So we still non VR. Yeah. Let's use that in this yeah. room. So, how has VR development changed Insomniac? You know, well, we are, we've got about 250 people between in, in two offices, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. And uh, we've grown a lot over the last 20 years. And what VR did was it took us back to that small, small team atmosphere, which I know a lot of people at Insomniac and I'm sure a lot of people out in the audience really appreciate because on a small team, you can move quickly, you can experiment. Uh, there's not a lot of overhead in terms of the decisions that you make. And with VR, we were forced to think differently about how we constructed our teams. And that was refreshing for us, and, and a little painful as well. Uh, so the, what was nice was with the small team, we were able to, I think, be more innovative than we are with sometimes with the giant teams. Uh, at the same time, we didn't have all of the resources that we have for a giant team, so we had to be more scrappy. And that, again, that took us back to sort of the garage mentality days, which, as a creative, is super fun. I'd say another thing that, uh, really surprised us were how many new challenges we ran into when it comes to design and, and construction. And what, Jason and I had a lot of talks about this during the first two games we made, which were Edge of Nowhere and Feral Rights, because I mean, you warned us. You said, you know, guys, if you, if you think of level design the same way you think of it for Ratchet or Sunset over Sunset or Spider-Man, you are going to have to, you're going to waste a lot of time. So, Try some different stuff. And the first thing we tried was to have, use the camera the same way we would in a Ratchet and Clank. Cameras following the character as he's running around the level, and the, num the first thing that happened was we all got sick. Uh, because when you're, you guys know this, and I'll just waste a little bit of your time, but when the camera is moving and you aren't sensing that movement, uh, it, it becomes disorienting. So we had to rethink how we did cameras, redesign the way, reapproach the way we design levels. And the result was something that uh, was surprising to us and we think players liked. Uh, but we also learned a lot about how do you set up an enemy setup in, in VR? How do you do HUD or UI in VR? 
How do you, uh, how do you create a game where you want to give the player a lot of sele weapon selection, but not take him out of the experience? Those are the questions that we had never had to ask in traditional games that we had to answer in VR. And I think finally, uh, it reminded us, just going, being a, being a developer and getting into VR, reminded us that there, this, this is a place where there really aren't answer, there aren't answers to many questions. And that was exciting for us because if you get into the more traditional games business, a lot of the big questions are generally answered. There, there are methodologies for creating levels, methodologies for process. VR, it's still the Wild West. And for us, that sense of discovery, even as a developer that's been around for two decades, was exhilarating. Yeah, it's, it's been very interesting to watch AAA developers go back to A or B developers, B developers become C developers, because all of the rules, everything they've learned, all of their experience is, is it's not invaluable, but it, it, or, or not, it's not not valuable, but it's not that valuable in yeah. VR. And, and the less you rely on what you know, the faster you enter good VR. Absolutely. Watch, watching Insomniac start with what they knew uh, with Edge of Nowhere, reject a lot of what they know, struggle and come out with Edge of Nowhere into a marketplace that accepted it and was uh, very excited about it, uh, even though it was 2D, 3D. It was, it was VR, but it could have been done yeah. on an older platform. Watching you continue that with uh, Feral Rights and watching the community reject that in a sense because the excitement they got from doing something they could have done in 2D in VR with Edge of Nowhere had worn off. This is all within a year, by the way, yeah. at six months later. And now they wanted VR for VR's sake, which is good and right. And they just didn't want Feral, right? And then watching Unspoken come out yesterday, uh, which is truly VR inspired and truly uh, takes advantage of VR, the first person, the hands, everything else. And again, for Insomniac to hit that magical eight, nine out of 10 kind of reaction from everybody, this is what we've been looking for. It's been amazing watching you go through that arc in such a short amount of time. So how have you internally thought, what should we be doing in, in VR? Because you, you've run the gamut. You've done the right thing, the wrong thing, and the right thing again, right, in, in a sense. Let me answer that, answer that as quickly as I can, because you're standing there saying we need to get off the stage. Uh, so, so, the, so the question, I mean, has been, Jason has asked frequently, and we've asked ourselves, why VR? Right? That is the question that we've learned to ask again and again in development. And the key is not to stop asking it. Our, our, imp, our I think, go-to place tends to be where we're comfortable. Uh, we're going to design a level a certain way. But if we don't ask, why are we making this game in VR, then we're not going to have a game that ends up like Unspoken, where it is built for VR's sake. And for us, that, mean, that really meant to we had to be comfortable with putting aside the core mechanics that we're used to dealing with and instead really do some things that were very uncomfortable uh, for us as a developer in terms of trying out things that just didn't seem like they would work at all and seem sort of antithetical to, to, to traditional design. But when we took the chance and did it, and when we pushed ourselves and the team to continue asking that question, things ended up working. I'm going to be bad and ask him one more question, because this is really, I, I think, important for everybody. <laughs> for developers that are out there, for people that are thinking about getting in VR, you've been in it since the beginning. You've put out more games than most others, more content than most others. Advice. So number one, play a lot of VR games, right? I think it's, we did this at the beginning, but we only did it in a limited sense because there were only demos that existed. And the, we learned very quickly that there are certain things you can and can't do in VR that work for game design. But now people getting in have a massive advantage over us when we got in because you have so many polished games and, and great experiences to play. So that's number one. Uh, number two, be ready to ditch your assumptions about traditional design. I think that's absolutely key. If you go in with a team that says, we know what we're doing with game design, we rock, they're going to get their asses handed to them very quickly because it's, it is really, you got to start over in terms of your thinking. And then finally, I think do it for the right reasons. Uh, as, as Jason said, and as a lot of, I think a lot of other people have said, this industry is in its infancy. And if you're getting in because I'm going to sell, you want to sell 100 million copies, well, you simply can't. But the opportunity to be in on this really exciting new wave of game development is invaluable, in my opinion. And under, learning those lessons now is something that you really can't, uh, it's priceless because you're in before everybody else. It's an opportunity to establish your brand, 
build new IP before the market gets flooded with lots of competitors, and I think uh, build new skills, really. And why are we here making games? Well, generally, we want to craft things, and we want to grow, and we want to learn new skills, and VR is a great place to do it. Great. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.